All right, we are going to kick this uh, program off and continuing from our previous session uh, with the conversation surrounding AI. Uh, I am going to welcome to stage Daniel Schwartz. Daniel is the Dean of the Stanford Graduate School of Education and a Professor of Education Technology. Uh, he also leads the Stanford Accelerator for Learning, which supports research and partnerships with the public and corporate sectors to create more effective and equitable learning solutions through data and tech. Uh, so we're really excited to have him here to uh, give us a little keynote address. So here to talk about efficiency and innovation in the age of AI, please give a round of applause for Daniel Schwartz. Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for having me back. I am your lunchtime entertainment. Uh, so AI is changing everything. It's the revolution. It's here, the imagined future. We can go boldly where we've never gone before. Let me show you what Star Trek predicted for 300 years from now. By now, I'm sure that most of you are aware that something special has happened. Yes, Loma. If there are people inside that ship, why aren't they coming out? We can't allow it right now because their craft has to be decontaminated. Now, who knows what that means? There you have it. We can go faster than the speed of light. We've replaced a hand with a light bulb, and we've become even more didactic. So this is, this is my little fear about AI, is it's going to get us very good at teaching for a different world than we live in now, where things keep changing, and how can we prepare people for that world? What I'm going to do is I'm going to describe two trajectories I've seen out there, one that emphasizes efficiency, one that emphasizes innovation. I'm going to point out that neither is going to get us to the kind of student we want, but there is a way to get there. So efficiency has a very long tradition, uh, making people faster, more accurate, less variable. This slide comes from uh, the late 1800s. The horizontal axis is weeks of practice. The vertical axis is the letters per minute that the teletype operator can send. And what you see here is a, a very classic curve that's now called the power law of learning. Early on, uh, you, you get good pretty quickly, but then it slows down as you try and squeeze out the remaining inefficiencies. Uh, those of you who have entered the pickleball era, the fastest growing sport in America, uh, you may have learned that it didn't take much to get into a good game, but the third shot drop, you just can't be consistent with it. Here's a more modern version of this. Uh, these are uh, people, children, solving simple addition and subtraction problems. And you can see as they get older, they get faster. And the way this looks in the brain is that early on, you're using a lot of the prefrontal region to do planning, monitoring, general strong conscious control. But over time, over time, it gets specialized and localized to a specific region, and you don't need to think about it. So as you become more efficient at something, it frees up cognitive resources to do other things. Uh, don't let your teenager talk while they're just first learning to drive. But once they've learned to drive, then they can have a conversation because they've automated so much of it. So uh, speed, accuracy, they're really important goals. Uh, that uh, decoding words, you don't want to have to figure it out. Uh, playing music, uh, these are just all valuable things. And AI can help. Right? And in general, technology has been used on the efficiency dimension. Gamification, tutoring systems, adaptive systems. If you think about them, the way you can tell they're for efficiency, it could, the goal is to get the students to correct answers sooner. Right? The goal is to increase the rate of learning and the outcome of learning. So one of the things I like about AI in the efficiency space is we can start uh, implementing some of the science of learning. So we've, we know a lot but it's hard to execute on it. So we know about categorization, how to help people categorize birds, chemicals, diseases for doctors. Uh, here's an example. Uh, your job is to say what breed of dog this is. 
And, and let's say you're clueless and you say it's a golden retriever. What, what the system does is it automatically finds a golden retriever that looks as similar as possible to the Labrador retriever so you can notice what are the distinctive features. So it's like uh, tasting wine side by side. Uh, if you get it right, what the system automatically does is it picks a Labrador retriever that looks as different as possible so you begin to learn what things are critical, like hair color is not. So this is a great example. It's a great algorithm. We can generalize it to any domain of visual categorization. So the problem is for efficiency is that it depends on a stable context. And if the future keeps changing, it's going to be a mismatch. So Americans, we're, we're very good at crossing streets until we get to London and they have to paint it in the street that you need to look to your right before you cross, right? And so the, the concern is that the AI is going to tune us very specifically to efficiency and it's really hard to let go of efficient routines. Once you have them, you stick with them. And then we have a, an assessment system that rewards efficiency. So my big concern is that AI may end up automating people, the peak of efficiency. The other trajectory is innovation. I don't mean anything particularly technical here. Uh, instead of trying to get the correct answer, the goal is to try and get something new, to create something new. This seems appropriate for being prepared for a, a future where things are changing. You're going to have to innovate new ideas and new methods. Uh, and then people love to use Gen AI for this. So I was at, uh, last year I was at three retirement parties, and in each one, the host wrote a poem with ChatGPT that they read to the retiree. They were very proud. They did not think it was cheating. Right. Uh, there's, innovation is not that mysterious. There are strategies that increase the chances that you can innovate. You can teach them. And then to the right, you see a couple of assessments that try and evaluate whether kids are actually using these strategies like you'd like them to. Uh, here's, this is from Freya. She's a three-year-old. She wrote a story with Dolly about a friendly witch that meets a grizzly bear. Uh, she was very pleased with this. It led her to come up with new ideas for her story. So AI can really supercharge creativity and help us surpass ourselves. Again, but it's, it is insufficient for a dynamic future. The way it is taught now is that we isolate creativity with spot lessons or maybe a class, and then we have all the content knowledge in the efficiency dimension in your STEM classes, your social sciences, your writing classes. The problem of divorcing innovation from knowledge is that you need knowledge to produce good innovations. Creativity equals novel and appropriate, not just novel. So one of my favorite demonstrations comes from Kay Burgess. She gave people this question. She said, uh, there's eagles that had no longer come to this lake. What questions would you like to ask to figure out how to solve this? And so uh, middle schoolers say, what do they eat? College students say, why did they leave? School superintendents say, what are the government agencies I need to work with to solve this problem? <laughs> so you can see, knowledge has a big effect on the kinds of creativity and innovations that you move towards. The big fear is that what you're going to get is you're going to get people that experiment lightly and develop no distinctive competence to make sense of new situations when they arise and the set of tools that you might use to address it. So I've said there's two dimensions, and from these you can sort of say, what is the image that we imagine of our learner in the future? If you follow the efficiency dimension, you end up with routine expertise. Routine doesn't mean pedestrian. It means you're very good at handling the routines of life, the recurrent situations, the ABCs. You're very good at this. Uh, the innovation dimension, you cumulative experiences, innovating, design thinking, creativity, uh, plays. The end of this, when I'm kind of in a snarky mood, the end of the innovation trajectory is the annoying novice. Uh, you know this person. They're in your meetings happily brainstorming without having any knowledge of the constraints of the problem or the possible solutions. I, I have a lot of meetings. So uh, Gio Hatano came up with a different construct, which he called adaptive expertise. These are people who have a strong base of knowledge of efficient knowledge, but they also know how to let go, why things work, and how to balance what they know with needs for new learning and new ideas. 
So adaptive experts seem like the kind of thing you need for people who are going to move into a world that keeps changing, and they're going to have to keep adapting to it. Here's a, here's a list of things that you would, uh, you would like to see in an adaptive expert. So the question is, uh, how do we get people there? And my proposal is that you let them innovate in, in a content area like STEM, like math, science, social science. And then after they've tried to innovate, you then show them the efficient solution that took years by scholars and others to figure out what's the right way to do this. And then you get them a chance to practice, and then you rinse and repeat and do this over and over. So this, this, uh, this shouldn't be surprising, but you don't see it. So I'm going to bring some evidence to bear on this. Uh, so bear with me. I am a professor. Uh, so this, this is a study with uh, people learning, students, college students learning eight memory concepts, things like primacy and recency. And in the efficiency condition, they got a chapter that described these eight concepts and their theories and how they show up. And they had to write a two to three page summary. They turned it in, and then they had got to hear a lecture on the same topic. Two weeks later, they got the description of a very new situation, and they had to predict what would people remember. And you can see they didn't use too many of the things they learned to solve that. Uh, the innovation condition, they received simplified data from classic experiments that demonstrated these eight phenomena. And their job was to innovate a way to characterize this and to explain what was going on. But they never got an explanation. They weren't told what was important. They, too, did not do so well in the novel situation. The condition where they innovated first, right? they tried to come up with their own way to think about the data, and then they heard the efficient solution. They got the same lecture as the efficiency condition. They do much, much better. So this innovation cues you to what's most important, and then the efficiency helps you handle it effectively. So I want to show this one other study uh, to make a different point. In this study, uh, this is uh, eighth graders learning about density and speed and ratio. Ratio is a big concept. And the efficiency condition is very traditional instruction. Uh, they were told about these situations. They were given examples. They were shown the formula. And they got a chance to practice. Uh, the innovation condition, they, they got to create, try and solve it on their own. And then they got the same efficiency instruction. Uh, a couple weeks later, they got a new situation that they had to adapt to, basically about springs, which percentage used ratios. You can see innovation efficiency did better. What I'm interested in here is the effects of achievement, prior achievement on this. So these are the scores of the students with the high GPAs in these classes. These are the scores of the kids with the low GPAs. Uh, I want to make two points. One. Uh, if you're a low-achieving student and you get the traditional instruction, you are not being prepared for a dynamic future. And it makes no sense to me that students who are, have not been served well, we keep teaching them exactly the same way. The other thing to notice is the innovation but efficiency condition, the low-achieving kids outperform the high-achieving kids who get the efficiency. So the way we teach does matter. So some of you are thinking, uh, Dan, what about efficiency first and then innovation? You know, you could go that route. Uh, maybe you like Bloom's taxonomy. Some of you are probably familiar with this pyramid on the, left, on the right. Uh, this is not what Bloom's taxonomy was. Bloom's taxonomy was this list of six things which he thought were all separate things you could measure. It had no implications for instruction. But in our efficiency-minded culture, what did we do? We made an implied hierarchy that you should start with remembering the basics, and then creativity is at the very end. Just to be clear, there is no evidence for this. Understanding improves remembering. Analyzing improves understanding. And as I'm proposing, creating improves all of these. The real reason you don't do efficiency first is that once people know the answer, they stop trying to learn anything new because they think they know. So I love this study. This is uh, this device. You can press buttons, and different kinds of things happen. The mother shows the child two or three of the buttons, gives the device to the child, and the child only uses those two or three buttons. The other condition, the mother just gives the device to the child, and the child finds all the buttons. Right. So the reason you can't do efficiency first is once you think you know, you stop discovering and looking for new things. So. 
Can I put this together and help AI to escape old ways of teaching suited to a bygone era? Here's an example that I really like that starts on the innovation. This is from Renata Fruchter at Stanford. She teaches college students to design buildings on the right. And then she uses very, very smart technology that renders that into a building. And then she takes that building and uses another piece of very smart technology that uh, computes the physics of it, like the forces and the walls. So Renata likes to empathetic design. So what she does after that is she has the student who designed the building go through the building in a wheelchair. And my proposal is this kind of experience of trying to create this and then seeing the implications of it is really going to set the students up to understand the efficient rules. For example, that corridors need to be eight feet wide. But at the same time, they're going to be adaptive. They're going to be able to think about what happens when there's two corridors that have intersections. So I'm representing the Stanford Accelerator for Learning. Uh, we, we believe there's a scientific revolution that we can harness. I've really focused on pressing needs for a dynamic future. I think we need a vision of what that learner should be to help us change the way we teach. To help this get fo uh, move forward, I'm going to launch a learning through creation portfolio where people try and figure out how can students create in Gen AI, in like STEM, social science, humanities, that sets them up to learn the efficient solutions, but also to become adaptive experts. My hope is that 30% of class time in the K-12 space can be spent with kids trying to innovate, which then sets them up to be efficient. I need your help for this. This is going to take a lot of creativity. And I want to remind you, creativity needs to be both novel and appropriate. So thank you. <laughs>